Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. I think our our readers, our liturgists are so grateful that we are entering into a season where I'm not making them read like chapters upon chapters or really difficult names. So thanks, Bob. You did great. Let us pray together as we start this Advent season. God, as always, we simply ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered here together in this room would be acceptable because, God, you are indeed our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So we are in the season of Advent. And I say it might be the first for some of you, Uh, not that it's your first year of birth. I think we only have one of those in the room right now. But because for many of us, we didn't grow up in traditions that celebrate Advent or Lent, or even like the liturgical calendar. And so I always like to start uh, seasons like this with explaining why we celebrate Advent why we celebrate even seasons like this. Did you know that today is actually the first day in the church calendar? All of you just shake your head. It'll make me feel like a good pastor. I did know that. That's very interesting. Yes, this is the uh, first day in the church calendar. And And it starts a new year, and we have three kind of cycles of years. Now, this is all just fun facts that you can pull out at a party later. You know, I'm sure all of you have, like, Bring that, don't do that. No one will like you if you do this at a party. But there are three years, A, B, and C, and they're known as the lectionary years. Again, tune out if none of this is interesting to you. But A, B, and C, and we are starting on year C. So what is the lectionary calendar? What does that mean? Well, there's this thing called proof texting where pastors kind of decide that we're going to grab this part of scripture and make it mean this, and we'll grab this part of scripture. And all of us, if we're honest, who are pastors, have favorite parts of scripture, and all of us have parts of scripture that we wish none of you would ever read. And so what the lectionary does is it helps remind us that there are uh, scriptures that go all around, and and it makes sure that within three years, we kind of hit every area. It sort of is a way of keeping us honest. Now, sometimes I use the lectionary, sometimes I don't. It's always a bit of a challenge, but for this Advent season, we are going to use the offered lectionary readings. They are the offerings of what we should read for each Sunday, and if you want to follow along, it's really fun to do. You're all like, no, it's really not, but it could be. Um, Imagine if it was. You could Google uh, lectionary for this year, and it'll give you readings you can do every day during Advent. So what is Advent? Where does that word even come from. Advent is the preparation of the birth of Christ. And it it comes from the word advantus, which is Latin, which was translating a Greek word, perusa, which is perusia, which is actually the idea of the second coming of Christ, or the idea that there will be a time when God will redeem all things. And the way that things were meant to go, or however you want to look at it, will happen. And so Advent is a way of looking at the world in three ways. The past, the story of the birth of Christ. The present, what's going on with us as we prepare our hearts for the things that we are waiting for. And the future, for what God has in the future. Now this is particularly important. Having seasons and a rhythm is particularly important when you're from California, right? Guys, we've had weather this week. Have you noticed? We had rain, which meant none of us could drive. We've had cold weather. I've had scarves on every day, right? We're not used to having such seasons. But the other thing we're not used to is when the sky goes gray. It was interesting. I was uh, out shopping, and uh, someone was saying how much they loved the gray sky. And I wanted to turn to him and say, I grew up in a town where it was gray most of the time. (laughs) enjoy your sun. <laughs> you know, like, we don't have the same sort of seasonal setting. We know that there is a bit of a change, but, but we really don't have this seasonal setting. It kind of is similar all the time, which is something we brag about when we're in other states, right? But there is a, a need for a rhythm 
of life. There is a need for a pace, isn't there? We know this because even as we look how, how God has made the ground where sometimes there's crops and sometimes there aren't, there is a rhythm and a rest. And if we just always go at the same pace, it's just not a way to sort of pattern our life. And so if we think about the church calendar is a way that we sort of rhythm our lives. It is a reminder that life includes the excitement of things like Easter, but there is the difficulty of Lent. That there is the excitement of Christmas, but there is that season of waiting. We don't always know how to wait, do we? My uh, beloved car that I have had for two years, that I wasn't sure I ever wanted. You know, for those of you who have been journeying with me in this ministry for a while, you know that I had a beloved Mini Cooper that was real fast. And I loved this car. I feel like that's a really bad confession. I loved it in a way that was helped. No, I, I did. I loved this car. And I, I got in a car wreck and I was devastated because I probably loved this car too much. It had something to do with my identity. I loved that it was little and fast and had an S on the back and it was turbo and I would valet it, you know, and when I would valet it, people were like, oh, cool car. And I was like, oh, whatever, this old thing. You know, I, um, it made me feel special. And then I got into a minor accident, but they ended up totaling my car. For those of you who were around me, you experienced me not knowing what kind of car to drive. And I was blessed by this woman from my um, former congregation who said, look, I have this uh, Camry and you can have it. What you guys don't know about Camrys is that um, when Jesus comes back, if you have that idea that Jesus will come back, it will be filled with, the earth will be filled with Camrys and cockroaches, right? Camrys run forever. And so this woman said, I have this old Camry. And I thought, well, and she, she, offered, she sold it to me way under value. And I, and I thought, I'll just have this car for two months. That was what I was going to, I'm going to have this car for two months because all of my friends that work in the car industry told me that cars start going down in the fall, you know? And I had the car for two years. Babs, my dream car. She was this old white car that I put surf racks on and Alex Maldonado stuck a sticker on the side that said it's a Toyota Camry thing you wouldn't understand. And I remember when I, the first day I got it, I was like the one, like the bumper looked like someone had run into it. The, the front headlight was out. And I had been invited to a party in Newport for a guy at my gym, and it was a fancy, fancy restaurant that only valets. I was behind a Lotus, a Lexus, and Babs. (laughs) And it was so funny how I learned, just even from this, what are my values? That I, why was I so upset about having a car that didn't have identity wrapped up around it? Babs taught me a lot about just loving things that work really well. In fact, it got to the point where people would say to me like, oh, I want to ride in your car. That back seat's like a couch. But last week, when I was away in Tennessee, my 2001 Camry went in for a checkup and they informed me that she was beyond repair. Her head gasket was out, two, like two engine mounts. Like I should be like stopped on the side of the road somewhere. And then the guy said to me, oh, I got to show you this. Hold on. And he showed me a video of my coolant bubbling, which if you've never seen that before, either had any of the mechanics <laughs> in that place. So why do I tell you about Babs? Babs taught me a lot about waiting, and even more so last week, because I decided I was going to drive a rental until I figure out what I was going to drive. And so David was kind enough to drive me over to the rental place. And I was having one of those mornings where you just have like so many meetings set up. And what did I do? I, I took my cell phone and I got all my stuff and I was going to go rent a car, but I, I knew I was going to have it for more than one day. So I rented the cheapest car. I went over to the airport David waved me goodbye, I hopped out, and I went up to the rental counter, and my car rental place was not there. And so I reached for my cell phone so that I could figure out exactly where I was supposed to be, discovered what? My cell phone was in David's truck. 
So then I asked the people, and they said, well, your, uh, your car rental place is off-site. They don't tell you that, but there's a shuttle over there. So I ran over to the shuttle, and then I had to do this thing that I haven't had to do in years. Stand and wait for something in the presence of other people with nothing to distract me. <laughs> and here I look like this total weirdo, just standing, making eye contact. <laughs> And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I start laughing. Because in my purse is my uh, notes that I had taken about this sermon on waiting. And I said, you're not funny. <laughs> and eventually, the shuttle didn't come. And so I ran across, and I finally, after waiting, like, I guess it was 10 minutes, I don't know, my cell phone's my clock. <laughs> But I ran across, It could have been two minutes, and I don't understand time anymore. But I ran across, and I said, you know, where is my van? I'm they said, oh, you have to call for that one. Use your phone. And I said, I don't have a phone. It was this moment where I realized that there's so little thing. There's not a lot that we wait for anymore, is there? We don't know how to wait. And you can tell that because even in a really short line, what happens? People pull out their cell phones. Or they grab the magazine next to them, or we don't know how to wait. It's almost like we've lost that ability to wait for things. And, and it's true, you know, the, the joke is if you want to know what someone's real personality is like, be with them with slow Wi-Fi, right? Waiting. But waiting is part of life. And so Advent teaches our souls on a soul level how to wait like our ancestors waited. When you hear this story in Jeremiah, this story that is suggested for us to hear, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promises I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now what you need to know about this scripture is Jeremiah is, is saying these things while he is imprisoned and his people are in captivation. There's like this huge army coming for them. And he's telling them that, that God is not pleased, but that God will fulfill his promise. Now you can imagine a people who have felt just sort of like they constantly are being inundated and Judah is the king and it's just all this stuff is going on. And Jeremiah is saying, no, 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 don't worry. Wait. God is sending someone. And we read this now, and we hear Jesus as we hear it, right? We say, oh, when he says someone, the branch is coming out of the house of David. You guys, I can't again and again. You know how I feel about David. Not my favorite. But David was the house, not that David, David from the Bible. Everyone look backwards, y'all. Um, David from the Bible, very flawed person. But from him was going to come this person, Now, all the people, as they were waiting, they experienced this thing called hope. So this first Sunday in Advent, as we hear this scripture, how many of us feel as though it is a difficult time to have hope? Every morning when I wake up, I ask Alexa, my robot, um, hey, Alexa, uh, what's my flash briefing? And if you don't know what that is, I don't know if I just did that at my house right now by saying that, but what that is is that I get the news. And every morning I, I listen to about three different news outlets. I like to hear dif different things that are going on. And every morning it feels harder and harder to hold on to hope. You hear about things going on on the border involving children, and you say, God, where are you? You hear about devastation in an area where they've already had so much devastation, and yet another thing, God, where are you? And you almost feel like the people of Jeremiah, as Jeremiah is, is talking to these people who feel like, where is God in this mess? Hope is hard. I remember... Uh, just three days ago, sitting in my car and, and finally getting to the point where I was able to listen to our climate news. Anyone listening to that? How do we have hope in that? And of course, we know some of the stuff, you know, news people, they don't really make a lot of money for giving us stories about hope, do they? <laughs> right? My friend always used to say, if it bleeds, it leads. So if you're already having anxiety, the anxious voices screaming at you are helping. Now throw into that the season known as the holidays. 
For some of us, joyful and fun. For a lot of us, there is anxiousness. How do we have hope in the midst of that? Well, I think there is this beautiful invitation to see things in a different way, to, for us, just the season of Advent, to really believe that God is with us even in the things we're waiting for. And that how we can hold on to that, that sort of difficulty in waiting is the hope. And how do we grow that hope? For me, it's about being grateful. Even in that silly moment that it, it really is a throwaway moment, you know, standing, waiting for. I was not suffering that much, standing and waiting for a rental car. How lucky I am that I can rent a car. By the way, it was for $11. I felt really good about myself for that. I stood and I decided that what I would do is look around and think about all the things I was grateful for, which was not easy in the midst of a very busy airport where most people wouldn't even look me in the eye. But I started thinking about, like, what am I grateful for in this moment? And the time passed quicker. Hope is not a naive thing. Sometimes when we talk about hope, we, we think it's like, oh, that's cute. You have hope for that. Hope is something that actually calls us to action. It, it makes us move. When we're in the wilderness, right, the wilderness of Advent, the waiting season, I wonder, what do you hope for? What does it feel like your soul is longing for? What do you hope for? What makes you excited when you think about it? What are you looking forward to? Is there anything? What are you hopeful for? In the wilderness, in this time of waiting, what are your greatest hopes? I even think about this, this church and what are we hoping for? I had a moment yesterday where I, I paused and looked over and, and Donna was putting together our Christmas tree. And I looked over and little Elia was helping her put the ornaments on. And I just had a moment where I was like, if I cry, it's going to be weird. But I kept thinking about how when I got here, our hope is that we would have children here in this space. And then later, as Barbara was explaining all of the nativity characters to Elia, again, just the fact that this hope that for many people felt like it was going to take forever. How do we have hope? Well, it's difficult because we don't always know what to hope for. The pathway, see, people thought that when Jesus came, he was going to be this like victorious leader. And because even from the time of Jeremiah, they're like, all these people are against us. And once this guy comes from David, he's just going to smite them, right? They're like hoping, that was their hope, was smiting. And then Jesus comes here and shows them a different pathway. It won't be one of victory. It will be one of service. Friends, my prayer for you is during this season as we prepare our hearts, as we think about what it means to hope, that we open our hopes and dreams to God. And that we'd be open to the ways that it might show up and look completely different. As funny as it sounds, my silly car is a reminder to me that sometimes God's answers to things look completely different. Sometimes the things that we want the most are, are not the things that will give us joy. May we be people open to how God is moving, to the unexpected, to the surprise that victory will come, not in victoriousness, but in a small baby. That as we listen to news, we will, we will look for those places of hope and that we won't be inactive, but instead, remember, hope is active, so we'll engage in those things that seem most kingdom-like. And as we do that, we'll feel the presence of God.